Hello. Okay, here we go. So, hi everyone. I'm Stefan Greber. I work at Canonical on the LexD team. I'm the project leader for Lexi, LexD, LexCFS. And today we're going to be talking about five years of providing root shells to random strangers on the internet. So, what's all that about? Well, we develop a piece of software um, that you can install. It's a container manager. It lets you, you know, run containers on your machine. But we know that a lot of our users are not running Linux. And so to evaluate our software, see how it works and play with it before they actually start using it on, on some cloud instance or on some physical server, we figured it would be quite convenient if they could just go on our website and click a link and then try the software right there for a few minutes. And if they think it's useful for them, then they can go and install it um, in production. We've been doing that for a number of, of years now, as I mentioned. Um, that's been quite successful. We've had tens of thousands of users trying LexD this way, several thousands more every month. Um, but there were a few issues with that. Uh, as a very complex system service, LexD runs as root. And now we had a bit of a problem of, you know, giving root shells to random strangers on the internet and trying to make this all safe because, well, we didn't really want to, to have to deal with a lot of security issues and people breaking stuff left and right. So, um, just a quick brief on what Lexity is, um, because it might better explain what we're running in there and also what we've been using to protects those very sessions. LexD is a system container and virtual machine manager. That latter part is somewhat new. We've only been managing virtual machines with it for the past four to six months now. For demo purposes, we really only focus on containers. Uh, letting random strangers on the internet run virtual machines um, is a bit trickier and not really something we're super keen on doing right now. So we really just focus on running containers. LexD, unlike some of the other container managers, lets you run system containers. So they are full Linux distributions that can install and run any normal packages and any normal workloads. We don't know what's going to run in there. And so to some extent, we can't really build like a very tight profile or restrictions around the expected workload because we've got no idea what the workload is going to be. LexD supports a variety of storage options and network options. Um, we support uh, ZFS, BRFS, LVM, Ceph, and plain directory for storage. For network, we support just about anything from SRIOV, uh, so for physical pass-through, uh, Mac VLAN, normal Linux bridging, IP VLAN. We support a lot of different options around there. And we offer a lot of knobs, uh, especially around security, to restrict what the container can do um, or allow a otherwise pretty safe and privileged container to do some amount of privileged actions that we deem to be safe. So that's kind of next day in a nutshell. Now, what we would like to demo through our website is the ability to create and start containers using images from an external image server, make snapshots of those containers, copy containers around, install software, whatever software the user feels like, like we don't, we have no idea what they're going to be installing. Um, apply resource limits on those containers, copy those containers to another system. Um, so that includes like two of those sessions connecting to each other and then being able to exchange data. So it, it's a reasonably complex demo, but it's a good base overview of what LexD can do. And we've, that's what we've been um, providing in one way or another for, for a little while now. So um, doing all of this safely, well, that's where things get, get funny. Um, so first of all, let's look at container security for a tiny bit. If you've been in uh, the talk I just gave with Christian, you're going to recognize that slide. Um, I, I'm not going to go in quite as much depth as we did, because otherwise it would take another hour and a half. But we can quickly go through the, the main components of container security. So you've got the file system layer for containers. That simply means the container has its own file system. Uh, we might run a Linux, different Linux distribution. We might be running the same as the host. We might be running 
you know, Android. Um, that comes with its own file system. We need that to show up as slash inside that container. So that's done through Chirrut or Pivotroot. Pivotroot being the safe variant of the two, that's what Lexi does. We just don't do Chirrut. Um, we use namespaces. UTS lets you do hostname, mount lets you create a new mount table. PID namespace gets you a new process tree. IPC namespace protects things like shared memory. The network namespace gets you a clean slate as far as networking devices and firewall, firewall, ah, firewall rules and uh, routing. The user namespace gets you your a shifted uh, subset of UIDs and GIDs from the host so that should you be able to escape the container somehow, you are not root on the host. Um, the C group namespace is mostly uh, to allow for nested containers and system DNA container to, to be able to manage their own sub C groups. So that's, that's why it's important there. Uh, and there's another namespace that was added very recently that we only started supporting last week which is the time namespace. Uh, that one lets you set an offset compared to the base system clock for your container. It's not particularly useful for most users, so Lexi doesn't drive it right now. Now, on the security layer, um, in all the examples we're going to be giving here for online demos, we will not be doing privileged containers because those are just unsafe and never something you should provide to anyone on the internet, or they're going to get full root access on your system in a matter of minutes. No, we're going to be using user namespaces, so unprivileged containers, which means that the security items you see there are effectively an extra safety net. Um, the user namespace on its own means that the container is running with the same privileges as a normal user. It is given extra privileges on resources that it creates itself, but doesn't have any rights on anything outside of, of that namespace. Now we can use LSMs on top of that. In our case, uh, we'll be using Aparma to prevent potential issues. So say you've got a kernel issue that lets you bypass some of the user namespace. Aparma maybe won't be affected by that bug and might prevent you from still accessing resources you should not be able to see. Same thing with SecComp. Um, like syscalls that are not suited for unprivileged use will not be allowed because of the user namespace but there's no harm in having a second policy, which also blocks them. Because again, if there's some kind of bug in which case, like in, where in some situations you might be able to use a privileged system call as an privileged user, having a, ses having a second policy um, ahead of that, which rejects it anyway, can only help security. And the same can go with uh, capabilities, where if you know that some capabilities you just don't need, you can start dropping those. And same thing, even though they were not, you were not supposed to be able to use those in the first place because of the user namespace. Now you really, really don't have them. Um, so even if you escape, you, you shouldn't have any problems there. For resource control, uh, we'll be using C groups, um, which gives you some, some amount of control on the resources that the container is allowed to use and can avoid a whole bunch of uh, issues around denial of service and just bad neighbor type situations. Okay, let's go through the requirements for that service. So first of all, we wanted it to be fast. So new sessions need to start within five seconds. We wanted it to be scalable. Uh, right now, the public service is configured for 32 sessions because we didn't have that many concurrent users, so we just removed some of the RAM and made it lighter. But we could easily move it back to 64 concurrent sessions, no problem. Um, it needs to be safe. We don't want a user on there to start attacking other users or outside services or be able to escape the container in, in some way. And it needs to be both reliable and low maintenance. We don't like we want. This is going to be the entry point for a lot of our users. We don't want those users to have their first expense with LexD be a crash. That'd be quite bad. Uh, so we want the service to pretty much always work. Um, we also are a very small team developing a piece of open source software. We are not sysadmins. Our day job is not to monitor this service. So we want it to just run itself. The only time at which we should be involved to the service is to update it every time we do a new release to move it onto the next release of LexD so that people can experience that. Now, 
before we go into some of the challenges and problems and uh, how we pull that off, um, we can go through the uh, the existing service and just kind of show you how that all works. So uh, let me move the mic here because I need to be closer to my other screen. Okay. Cool. So let's switch to this. So that's the entry point uh, for our nine demo service. You've got some basic terms of service, which are mostly there as a legal safety net in case someone does abuse the service uh, or find some way around the security measures we've put in place. Um, you, get, you hit the button saying, I want a session. Um, takes about five seconds, and you get a root shell. So yeah, we weren't kidding when we were saying we're giving root access to random people on the internet. We definitely are. Um, now, if you run ID, it's even running root in the root group. If you look at processes, uh, we've, we've trimmed the container as much as possible, not for security concerns, just to not waste resources. So even though we do run systemd, we only run just the one unit we care about, which is the LexD daemon, and everything else is off um, because it's just plain not needed. Now, a normal user would then go down there and go through some of the instructions. Um, for example, you can click on instructions that executes the command immediately up there. Um, there's like an instruction to create a new container, so they can click on that, and we'll see it pulls the image. We'll unpack it and then create the container. There we go. So now that user has created a container running on next day. Um, Let's launch ourselves another container. Let's base this one off Ubuntu 2004. Give it a few seconds. There we go. And it should be booted at this point. It is. Now let's get the shell inside there. This one we can see has a lot more processes running. Uh, that's because it's a clean Ubuntu 2004 image. It's not a customized sim image or anything. Um, and let's install SL. So as you can see, I'm perfectly capable to hit the internet and actually download packages from, from that environment. And we can run SL and see a nice train crossing the screen. Now, that nested container, um, well, that, that container that's running now has access to all the resources of its parent. We can see it sees two CPUs and um, what is that? Yeah, 256 megs of RAM, effectively. But we can, we can change that. So the user, while playing with the service, can totally reduce the memory and apply me further memory limits on, the, on their workloads. And we see the memory has been reduced. Um, the CPU limits don't always get to apply um, without a restart. But there we go. Now, we can do some, as I mentioned, we can do some fancier things there. Um, say I get another session here. Yeah. And I start it. At the top, I'm given a command, which is used to connect two sessions together. So I can copy that into the first one, say yes. And now uh, that means that that particular Lexi client can see both itself, and it can see the other session. So that's another funny aspect, because we actually need networking working between them. Let's create a snapshot of that F1 container we created. And now let's move, well, let's copy that snapshot onto the second instance as a new container called F2. So now that's doing burrfs and then receive um, of that container from one demo instance to another demo instance. There we go. And now we can start it. And so if we list local, that's what we have. And if we see on the other one, that's what we have over there. 
and we can get a shell into that remote container and just interact with it perfectly normally. So that's the stuff that's possible. I mean, there's, there are a lot more features that are possible. Um, like one of the things we've got in our example is just showing you starting other distros. So in this case, I'm starting a CentOS 8 container, for example. Uh, our entire image server is available, and people can use that uh, at this up until they hit the uh, disk limit we've applied. CentOS is a bit larger. It takes a tiny bit longer to, to unpack. There we go. So if I get into CentOS 8, okay, I'm on. You confirm it's running Red Hat, uh, well, CentOS in this case. Now for the things that are other things that are possible and not possible. So in the base session that you the base root terminal you offered, you can totally update your package list. That's that's perfectly fine. We let you do that. Come on. All right. Um, we even let you install packages. There's also no real problem with that. Come on. You can do it. Why is the last percent always longer than any of the others? OK, um, so let's say we install curl. Again, no problem there. We're just pulling a bunch of packages from the internet and installing them. Processing trigger. There we go. All right, now at last, some things that do not work. Uh, let's try to access Google. Huh, that doesn't work. Let's try to access some random IPv4 address. That's weird. What's going on here? Well, we don't give you any IPv6, IPv4 addresses. Well, you only have IPv6. We don't really need IPv4, so why would we give that to you? And if you try to access something about IPv6, you'll notice that same thing. We don't let you access a lot of things. Um, so that's pretty much the state of the state of this. Um, let's go back to. There we go. So let's go through some of the. Um, problems with running a service like this, uh, possibly from most obvious to least obvious or from easiest to deal with to worst to deal with. Um, the first one would be networking. So most, I mean, the most common issue on there is really people trying to attack uh, outside services because they feel like they've got an easy root shell and they, they're reasonably sure they're anonymous to some extent and that they can then use that to do mass mailing or attacking servers or scanning people. So that's that's a bit of a common pattern for what we've seen as far as networking. The other thing which less people try is interfering with other containers, effectively just making the entire experience miserable for other users. A uh, bit less rewarding because you're not actually doing something that might earn you money. You're really just annoying people. So eventually you, you're probably going to get bored of doing that, but it's yeah, it's just something, something else to keep in mind. Uh, you've got some solutions for that. The first one is firewall the hell out of everything, which is exactly what we're doing. As you've seen, we can't reach Google. We can't reach a lot of other things. Um, the only services that are effectively allowed are services that we ourselves own or that we have an agreement with the people that own them. So in this case, I do work for Canonical. We make Ubuntu, so I don't really have a concern with letting someone access the Ubuntu archive servers because I know they're static web servers anyways, so there's not much you can do there. Um, and it's pretty easy to, to set up rules to just allow those very specific use cases we care about. Same thing with the image servers. We run the image servers. We don't have any concerns with people trying to attack those. Um, we also know that they're fully static, same thing, so we just allow those. Um, 
as far as attacks between containers, that's where things get a bit a bit weirder. Um, you can restrict internal networking uh, using filters. That doesn't always work depending on what kind of workload you care about. So the filters in LexD work perfectly well. You can filter IPv4, IPv6, and max spoofing, no problem. Uh, but if your workload requires bridging or getting its a separate MAC address on the parent network, then that, that just can't work. So it's kind of a bit of a balancing game there. The other thing um, to cover are privileges. So I kind of hinted at that earlier around the user namespace, but um, container escape is a real issue with, with that kind of services. Um, and you want to be careful of what you're doing there. Um, that mostly mean the, no, uh, no privileged containers using only unprivileged containers. The other aspect to that is being able to create denial of service attacks based on shared UIDs and GIDs between containers. That's possible even between unprivileged containers. So naive implementations of unprivileged containers can get you into trouble still. You need, you need to be quite careful with that. The solutions there uh, for the container escape case is what I covered in security slide earlier. So use the user namespace, set up seccomp, set up LSMs, so that you've got your main mitigation measure being the user namespace with the rest as safety nets should something go wrong. Um, for the denial of service part, what you need are isolated user namespaces. That's something that LexD supports, it's a configuration flag. And that means that every single container gets its own range of 65,536 UIDs and GIDs that do not overlap on the host with any other container. That does restrict the number of containers you can run, but that restricts that to 65,000 or so, which is usually not a problem. Um, uh, but it, it completely prevents that entire class of attack. Like it is no longer possible to do uh, U-limit type denial of service attacks. Um, resource consumption. So that's kind of yeah, the other aspect of that. Um, we need to deal with two different things. One is just load on the service as many people use it. Uh, so we obviously see that every time we do a major new release because the service is used at 100% for a number of hours or days. And we don't want one user to be able to use the bulk of the resources and then give a very bad experience to everyone else. The other aspect is that there's, there are going to be some people there to just try and annoy everyone else. So they're going to try and do denial of service attacks. They're going to try to run fork bombs. They're going to try to use all the CPU, all the memory, or all the, all the network. Um, the solutions there are pretty much the same in both cases, which is C groups. So you want to set CPU, memory, and network limits um, to just make it fair for everyone. So like set an amount of memory that everyone gets, the amount of CPU that everyone gets. Other commissioning is perfectly fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to kind of know what your maximum usage pattern will be and what your normal usage pattern looks like and kind of set the limit somewhere in between. Now, for the OS attacks, you need some extra limits around things like process limits. So that if someone tries to run a fork bomb, all they're going to do is kill their container effectively. Like they're going to run themselves out of processes, but they're not going to take out the, the entire system. The interesting thing here is that when they do it, they it will look to them to some extent, like if they succeeded, because like their terminal won't work anymore. If they try to spawn another terminal, it won't work either. They'll be like, hey, I well, took down the service. When they've just taken down themselves, which that's great, that's exactly what we want. Um, same goes with the memory limits. You know, they're going to get weird errors, memory related. They will trigger the out of memory killer. They will trigger a lot of like nasty looking errors, uh, but it really only affects themselves, so it's fine. You probably also want to restrict just the length of the session. In our case, we give 30 minutes slots. It's just, yeah, makes it a bit more fair so that everyone has a chance. Also prevents people from poking around for too long. Uh, and we also restrict the number of sessions per IP because same thing, there's no, like you need to have more than one of them because otherwise you can't do the copy demo I did. But if you've got, um, if you allow a lot of them, then someone might just end up using half of your slots, which would be unfortunate. Okay, the next class are kernel bugs. 
uh, that tends to be the, the main point that a lot of people bring up around those kind of container deployments. Um, and it is a perfectly fair one. Um, the Linux kernel is not perfect. There are security issues. Um, not that many of them tend to apply to containers these days. That definitely wasn't true at the beginning of the username space where we had a bunch of pretty nasty security issues. These days it's reasonably good, um, but still something you need to keep a close eye, like a pretty close look at um, because that can be an issue. Uh, those that are denial of service attacks uh, are obviously a problem, but not devastating in many cases. Privilege escalation is the, the the big issue. Um, and for those, the only thing you can really do is make sure you're up to date. So the solutions tend to be, if you can live patch, if your distro supports live patch and is quick at releasing live patches, then do that. On top of that, or as, at least as an alternative to that, you should be extremely aggressive to, on applying updates and rebooting immediately after the kernel security fix. Um, that's definitely what we've been doing. Um, we take applying security updates above everything else. Uh, if someone gets disconnected and they've got to get a fresh session, you know, a minute later when the service has restarted, that's fine with us. And well, hardware can't really be trusted anymore. So that's also a bit of a problem. Uh, Spectre and Meltdown are real things that have caused a bit of havoc around that. Um, so for, for those kind of things, you can have two options. One is it's a dedicated physical server and you don't care because nothing else is running on it. So people being able to potentially eavesdrop is not a big concern to you. Um, if the system is shared in some way, then you're going to need to deal with things like CPU pinning. So effectively making sure that you dedicate a number of, C of physical CPU calls to a service like that and you never put anything else on those CPU calls. That way, even if you've got multi-threading enabled on those, it's not really an issue. Your users might be able to eavesdrop on each other within the demo service, but they're not gonna be able to do anything much more than that. Um, if that's not an option for you, um, then you should at the very least disable SMT. So turn off hyper-threading effectively. And an alternative to that, which has been worked on quite a bit recently would be core scheduling. So effectively configuring the kernel so that it knows um, that mm -hmm. those specific workloads cannot be scheduled on the same core as some other workloads. Mm -hmm. At which point that, that guarantees that there's no mm -hmm. hyper thread um, type attacks possible because the only time where two, the two threads would be used at the same time would be if it's the if it's the demo service using both of them at the same time. It effectively avoids those kind of problems. Um, there are a few trade-offs and additions we did um, for the actual production service. I did mention network filtering and how we can prevent IPv4, IPv6, and MAC address spoofing. Unfortunately, because our own use case is to run a container manager, we can't do that since we are using nested containers that are connected to the same network as their parent. That means that those containers each put a new MAC address on the network as well as a new IPv4 and IPv6 address. That effectively prevents filtering. But if you're using something like this for any reason, for anything other than running a container runtime inside, then you should totally do that because that will, that will save you a lot of uh, potential headaches from people trying to be uh, annoying. The other thing is, and kind of the same issue to some extent, um, we are using BRFS for storage rather than using something um, with stronger quota enforcement like ZFS. The reason for that is also that BRFS is the only file system that lets you do proper container nesting without wasting disk space. So in this case, we've decided to kind of, you know, bit the bullet and use PerFS knowing that some of our users might try and bypass the limit um, rather than use ZFS, which would have guaranteed they wouldn't, but also would have significantly increased the disk usage uh, per container. So that was kind of the compromise we had to do on that one. Uh, we're still hoping for ZFS to eventually support proper container, uh, proper use in, this, in containers, but it's not there yet. Uh, we've made a few, additions to on top of everything as it was discussed. 
in our case, the, the host that we use is actually based on Ubuntu Core 18, which is a image-based, um, effectively read-only transactional system. So that does help a bit in that even in the worst case scenario where someone manages to escape, there's not much they can actually write to or do on the host uh, because pretty much everything is read-only and checked um, through hashing whenever it's installed or updated. We also do automatic updates every 15 minutes. So that usually tends to get any kernel update applied pretty much immediately. And we've got kernel live patching enabled on top of all of that too. So uh, now for another bit of demo, I'm just gonna show you how you can run your own search service because we've made that pretty easy. So I've got a system here that's just a random development machine I've got uh, in my basement. And I'm gonna be installing, starting by installing LexD. So install LexD. Then we'll be installing a second package called snap LexD demo server. Okay, now we configure LexD. So uh, we don't really need any of the fancy features or anything at this point. So we'll pretty much just hit enter to everything that makes it pick ZFS by default for storage. That's okay uh, for this particular use case. There we go. Then let's create a new container uh, using, let's see, Ubuntu 2004, and we'll call that my demo. Okay, so grab the image and pack it. And start the container. Now uh, let's go in that container and install again SL. Why not? Let's do that. Okay, let's just make sure it works, but I'm pretty sure it does. Yep, all good. So our container is now ready. Let's run Lexi demo server configure. Get us into a text editor. In there, you've got the choice of either creating your demo sessions from an existing, or from an image that's available in the store or available from some server you, may, you manage yourself, or by using an existing container. So in our case, we'll do the latter. So we're gonna comment that image line and we're gonna be using the My Demo container. We'll use default profile, that's fine. The command, we're gonna customize that so that the any demo session just starts SL. Uh, we can allow people leaving feedback, that's all right. Uh, one CPU, 200 processes, 256 megs of RAM, two sessions per user, that's fine. Half an hour sessions. Uh, let's send the this quarter, because why not? Let's do one gig. The rest you can customize what port it binds to and list of uh, IP addresses that are banned from using the service because they broke the rules. You can also configure things like whether you're on IPv6 only or not, uh, if the service is currently under maintenance, and there's an API to uh, retrieve that user feedback that they can leave at the end. So that's what those tokens are for, and you can write the terms of service so down in there. So we just save that. And we restart the service. Okay, now, Let me switch back to a web browser. Uh, okay, and that's that's what the um, the user is going to get when they go on on that web server. Do you see the terms of service? Can hit the button to approve to accept them, and the, term, the container is created and the command is run. At which point the session will disconnect, and that's it. If they click on on reconnect here, they're just gonna be attached to the exact same session again, which is gonna just spawn the command again and get to see the train another time. So that makes it pretty simple. Like you can, if you're 
if you wrote a uh, command line based piece of software, you can effectively make the demo session land straight in the piece of software when they close it, that resets the session. Um, now we can see if I switch back to the terminal here. On that system, if I look at uh, what's running, we can see we've got try it dash great, which is the automatically generated name that the system took. And that's a container that's running. After 30 minutes, it will automatically get stopped and deleted. So let's switch back to slide. I'm already at the conclusion. I think the, the, the demo went a tiny bit faster than I expected. Um, so it's possible to offer root shells to random strangers on the internet and not get pawned immediately, which is nice. But you need to be careful. Um, there, there are lots of things to keep in mind there. Um, as I said, we've done it for five years. We've not actually, we've seen a number of abuse. I mean, the, um, the list of problems I ran through earlier are based from, from real experience. Like we definitely had users try to attack it in a number of ways. Um, prior to even doing that service, we were, I was doing something even riskier to some extent, uh, which was uh, for a Linux distribution called Edubuntu, which is like an educational variant of Ubuntu. We had an integration in the desktop where you could try any any application you wanted, and that would spawn a remote container, install the graphical application, and then export it through the no machine protocol, which is like a slightly nicer version of VNC, effectively, back to the client. And the client would then just run that application like if it was local, effectively, for up to, I think, 10 minutes, then it would disconnect. Uh, we pretty quickly had people uh, installing all kinds of shells and then trying to do mass mailing, trying to port scan the entire internet and doing a whole bunch of weird things. Um, we didn't have a very strong firewall on that at the beginning. Uh, so it was definitely a bit of a lesson learned there and not a problem we had with the LexD one because that was a few years later and I've already <laughs> learned from that. Uh, so, but still like looking at some of the, the initial sessions, uh, maybe for the first couple of days or so that we had that service up for LexD, we definitely saw people installing a whole bunch of your usual port scanning and uh, vulnerability scanning tooling, and then trying to both scan the infrastructure that they're running on, see whether they could attack us, but also just try to attack the internet. Thankfully, firewalling was blocking all of that, and our own systems are up to date, so not an actual issue, but still, uh, <laughs> people definitely tried. Also, script kiddies. Um, that was actually a bit of a problem at the beginning of that service because the PIDs C group is pretty recent and did not exist back then. So five years ago, when we launched the service, we actually had no way to prevent the fork bomb. Uh, the only way we could do it was by limiting memory, specifically kernel memory, and hope that they would run themselves out of kernel memory before the system would have um, like a very negative impact. That. Yeah, that, that kind of worked. Um, but the, the PID C group is definitely much better and just blocks that kind of attack, uh, kind of attacks in their tracks, no problem. Um, the, otherwise, the main thing I would, I would try and, and recommend there is, you know, make sure everything is well isolated, everything is kept up to date and that you monitor things as closely as you can. Uh, you can pretty much count on some people abusing it, no matter what you write in the terms of service, no matter what kind of limits you put in place, um, people are going to be people. And the best you can do is try to not uh, try to notice repeat offenders and just block their IPs for a while. Uh, that tends to send them away. That's definitely what we've been doing. We've not actually had any very nasty security issues or anything. We would just notice that, hey, the, the system load is particularly high. And every time we'd notice that, we'd see the same IP addresses connected to it. So like, okay, there's definitely something wrong going on there. Um, but otherwise, this this whole thing is a great, great tool uh, to onboard new users. I mean, we've definitely had you know, tens and 
tens of thousands of users going through that by now, probably hundreds of thousands. Um, and getting to test our software and especially test the latest version of it online without having to install anything anywhere has, has been a very, very good tool for, for our users. And that's it. Uh, so that gives us about 10 minutes for questions. I don't believe we've got any right now. Let me just open that thing. Oh, actually, no, we do. Never mind. Not sure why I didn't see that immediately. Let's see. OK, let me just read the question first, and I'll repeat it. OK, um, first question is someone who had permission issues accessing something that was NFS mounted inside a LexD container. So in that case, that would be an NFS mount on the host system passed as a bind mount into the container and then accessed from within that container. What you would most likely see in those kind of cases is everything showing up in that share as nobody, no group. Um, that's because of the user namespace in place, which will prevent uh, prevent you. Well, which will cause that that shift. Um, I can better show it here. So if I look at my containers, we see that right now everything is running as one hundred thousand inside them. Even though that process will show up as being root inside the container. Now, if I was to say. So I'll just create a file in slash SRV. Oh, blah. And uh, what's the name of my de my demo? Is the name of my container. So I'm gonna add a new disk uh, to my demo. Um, just call it test. Call that a disk. The source is gonna be SRV. Blah. And the path in the container is gonna be let's. Oops. No, the source is gonna be SRV. We'll mount that as MNT SRV in the container. So if I go in the container and I look at MNTSRV, my blah file shows up as nobody, no group. Whereas on the host, that same file shows up as root, root. That's because of that gap. There's effectively no way to represent root, root, so zero, zero in that container because the container is shifted and that UID just plain doesn't exist. Um, the easiest way to solve this is through a file system called ShiftFS that we've implemented in Next Day. It's currently disabled by default because we're because of some restrictions still on it. Uh, but say if we enable it and then we restart Next Day. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna stop that demo container now. Okay. Device. I'll remove that device I added, which was called test. And what we do is we'll just add it back with shift equals true, and that should work. There we go. So with that, um, so I had to enable ShiftFS support in NextD, and then I removed that device I passed from the host and re-added it with an extra property saying shift equals true which now means that we've got a kernel layer, translation layer, which for that particular mount, in that particular mount alone, uh, lines up the IDs outside and inside the container. So now root outside the container appears as root inside the container. And so if in that container I was to do a survey foo and say, I don't know, uh, let's uh, send it on a shape to one, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. Now, if we look for the same thing on the host, we'll see that just went through without the uh, um, ID range mapping that happens with the user namespace. So that's our best solution around that, that lets you still run fully and privileged containers, including isolated maps, and yet share data either with other containers or with the host um, by using the ShiftFS kernel file system to, to shift things for you. Another question. Uh, let's see. So the other question was around using Tomoyo for security on, on Linux. 
So Tomoyo is an odd, my understanding of Tomoyo is pretty limited. Uh, I understand it's another mandatory access system. Um, so I think it's a LSM, Linux security module. In our case, we use Apalmer because we run on Ubuntu, um, but Tomoyo would be an alternative to that. There is work being done upstream to allow mix and matching LSMs. Um, so that's called uh, Linux security module stacking and namespacing. Right now, it's not quite there yet, um, which means that if your host system, say in my case, an Ubuntu server, uses a banner, I can't have the container use something else. We hope this will be changed within the next couple of years, hopefully, at which point we'll be able to have a host running a banner and then the container will be protected by SLinux or Tomoyo or Smack. Uh, or the reverse and have the host running as a Linux and then the container will be protected by a Palmer. That'd be, that'd be really nice. And those implementations effectively means that the rules would, would combine, which would then let you use a combination of the host profile, which could be, again, be a Palmer or a Linux or Tomoyo or whatever. And then your container itself having its own set of rules, which is in a different LSM and lets you kind of get the best of all worlds by combining LSMs that might have slightly, um, different feature coverage. So definitely something very exciting. We, we would love to have that. That would also unblock use cases like running a Android container on an Apama protected kernel and having that container use a Linux policy for the apps. Or same thing if you're running like a Red Hat based distro on top of a, something like Ubuntu, that would also let you run a Linux inside the container and Apama on the host or the reverse when running Ubuntu or OpenSUSE or something like that on top of a Red Hat-based distro that would let you run a Palmer on top of the Selenux. So it's something we're really excited about, but it's not quite there yet. And for now, our expertise tends to be around a Palmer, if only because that's what defaults in Ubuntu. And so what we have, what we get to play the most with, given that's the, the kernel we interact with the most. Okay. I believe that was the only two questions we got. Um, so can wait another you know, 30 seconds to a minute or so just to see if there's any other last minute question. Otherwise, we're going to be wrapping up. Giving you another 20 seconds. Fifteen. Ten. <laughs> okay, well, getting a few people saying thanks. Well, thank you all for attending and, and for watching. Um, it was definitely a lot of fun. And if you've got any more questions, I'll be on Slack for a little while, so you can always ask there. Thank you all. Bye.